Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation, Irrational But Predictable, When to Use Monetary Incentives to Motivate Employees, presented by Emory University professor, Dr. Karen Setatal, in collaboration with Ivy Exec. My name is Andrew Valdez, and I am part of the team here at Ivy Exec, and it'll be my utmost pleasure to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping items for our audience. Uh, first, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. Um, however, we do encourage you to engage in the session by asking questions to our presenter, which you can do by using the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We do encourage questions during the presentation, and we will also have a formal Q&A session during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation. And now, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Professor Sedatal. An award-winning researcher, Dr. Karen Sedatal is an expert in the areas of reward systems and employee performance measures. Her research specifically focuses on the design and effectiveness of performance measurement and reward systems, the role of forecasting and budgetary systems within organizations, and control in inter-organizational inter collaborations. Her most recent research on bias employee evalu evaluations can be read in the Harvard Business Review. And with that, it's my honor to hand the presentation over to Dr. Sedatal. Thank you, Andrew, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, as the case may be. Thank you very much for tuning in to this webinar on the effectiveness of monetary incentives to motivate employees. I'm going to see if I, here we go. Uh, I selected this topic because monetary rewards, it turns out, have been getting quite a bit of bad press lately. Alfie Cohn is one of the most outspoken critics of monetary incentives. And he had a recent New York Times opinion article in which he proclaims science has confirmed that monetary rewards amount to bribes that don't work. So that's a pretty strong claim. And it's a little bit hard. Uh, it's hard to buy that claim, given that we see monetary rewards being used in business organizations, uh, you know, pretty extensively. And it's also stirred up quite a bit of controversy within the business community. Uh, in, in fact, you'll see some debates in the Harvard Business Review about the ideas that Alfie Cohn has put forth. So one of the questions that you know, I want us to think about today is whether or not science really has confirmed this. And it turns out it's, it's not quite so clear and it's a little more nuanced than that. So I'm excited to share with you some of the research and some of the things that we do know about monetary rewards and when and if they work and how to a little bit on how to design those wards, rewards. Uh, so my agenda, the first thing I thought we would do is talk a little bit about different models of human behavior. You know, how, what do we think? How do economists think? How do, do psychologists think that people behave in various situations? I'm going to introduce a concept called homo economicus. Uh, and we're going to think a little bit about what that means and whether or not we are, you, you are a homo economicus and whether I am. And if not, why not? Uh, and then we'll move into uh, the implications this has for monetary rewards and whether or not they work. And, and you know, when is pay for performance effective? And we're going to look at, you know, three different, uh, three different situations, the quality of the performance measures, the type of the task, and the type of the reward that all affect whether or not monetary rewards will be effective in any given situation. So let's start with this concept, homo economicus. It's Latin for economic human. Now, I, I didn't make up this term. In, this term, it, it's used quite extensively in the economics field. Uh, but it, it describes a model of human behavior that's very rational, uh, and very rational in sort of an economic sense. So here's an example. Um, let's say you're hungry and you fancy an apple at a fruit stand, and, and so you go to the grocery store and there's three different options for apples. There's one that's 35 cents, one that's 40 cents, and one that's 45 cents. You know, which would you buy? Now, these all look exactly alike, and they are, in fact, identical. And, and so this is not a trick question. Obviously, you would buy the 35 cent if these are truly all identical. And that's, that's a very homo economic, economicus way to respond to that particular question, because you would be acting in your own rational self-interest. You know what you want, you can judge the utility, and utility, by the way, is an economist's word that just means how much you value it or how happy you are. And usually we think about utility in a monetary sense, so you know how much wealth you get from that particular decision. And you're also going to act very selfishly and rationally to maximize your utility. 
So that's a very simple example that just shows the rational thinking of somebody who's behaving in a way that homo economicus would predict. So when I think of homo economicus, uh, I always think about the movie Wall Street and Gordon Gecko, And so, so he's this just completely rational, uh, wealth maximizing individual and really doesn't care a whole lot about others, uh, doesn't care about fairness, doesn't care, you know, doesn't care about some of those other things. He's just completely selfish. Uh, this is from uh, this quote that I have. It's from a book, Freakonomics. I know most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with that book. And many of you have probably read the book. And th this quote says, unlike his uncle Homo sapiens, which is you and me, Homo economicus is unswervingly rational, completely selfish, and can effortlessly solve even the most difficult optimization problem. The discipline, it turns out, the discipline of economics is built on the shoulders of this mythical creature, myth, mythical species, because none of us, it turns out, are truly homo economicus, at least not all of the time. But a lot of our economic theory and a lot of the historical economic work has assumed that people be behave in this very rational, sort of selfish way. So the question is, you know, to what extent are we homo economics, economicus? To what extent do we behave in that way? Are you homo economicus? Is anyone? So Andrew, let's find out how economically rational our audience is. I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to simply answer yes or no. Imagine you're about to purchase a jacket for $125 and a calculator for $25. Siri, Siri informs you that the calculator is on sale for $15 and another branch of the store just a few minutes away. Would you make a trip to the other store? So again, a jacket for 25 and a calculator, sorry, a jacket for 125 and a calculator for 25. You can get the calculator for 15 at another branch just a few minutes away. Would you make a trip to the other store? Andrew, let's see what our, our participants would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just launched the poll into our attendees. Um, you can see the quick poll um, on your screen here. Um, and I'll leave it open for about the next 30, 45 seconds. Um, then I'll read the results. So just a reminder to our attendees to uh, ask questions and uh, on the chat box. And of course, we'll have time at the end. But of course, uh, please respond to the question for the first poll for Dr. Uh, Professor Setatol. Looks like we have about 73% of votes uh, in so far. So keep it open for another 10, 15 seconds. All right, uh, Dr. Setatol, looks like 78% have voted and and uh, looks like 75% responded yes and 25% responded no. Okay, 75% of you uh, would, would make the short drive to get the calculator on sale. All right, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to clear your mind because if I were really doing this experiment as it had been done in the past, I would have randomly assigned some of you to the first question, which I just asked, and some of you to the second question, which we're about to ask. But since it's difficult to do that in this webinar format, I'm going to ask all of you uh, both questions. So, so clear your mind. Try not to let your answer to the first question sort of bleed into the answer to the second question. So the second question we're going to ask is not too different, but in different in an important way. Imagine you're about to purchase a jacket for $25 and a calculator for $125. Siri informs you that the calculator is on sale for $115 at another branch of the store just a few minutes away. Would you make a trip to the other store? So a calculator for 125, and you can get it on sale a few minutes away for 115. Would you make a trip to the other store? Andrew, let's see what our attendees say. All right, just launch the poll. Right. 
I have a lot of people thinking about this. <laughs> Dr. Shetatal, it looks like we about 85% have voted and I'll go ahead and close the poll here in about five seconds. Okay. All right, it looks like 59% have responded yes and 41% have responded no. Great, so you guys have just exhibited some very non-homo economicus behavior. Uh, in the original study, and this was done, I believe, back in the 1980s uh, by some famous economists, uh, Kahneman and Tversky. And what they discovered was that uh, comparing the $25 to the $15 calculator, about 69% said they would drive to get the, the calculator on sale. That compares to 75% for all of you. But when it's a choice between $125 versus $115 calculator, they found that 70, uh, only 29% would make the drive, and that compares to 59% to all of you. Now, the levels are not what's important here, the absolute percentages, but the fact that it's different between the two questions is what's important here. And the fact that you responded differently to these two scenarios is, very, is behavior that is not in line with homo economicus uh, behavior. Because if you're willing to drive the 10 minutes to save $10 in one instance, you ought to be willing to do it in the other. And, and to say that you would make a different decision under those two situations that are, from an economic perspective, exactly the same, then that is, is non-rational behavior, at least from an econo economist's point of view. So somehow you're evaluating these things differently. You're, you're looking at this in more of a, a relative sense. Let's try another one. Imagine you've decided to see an ABBA tribute concert. And, and, and by the way, Let's assume that we all really want to see the ABBA tribute concert, okay? So if, if you really dislike ABBA, think about some other concert you'd rather see. But imagine you've decided to see an ABBA tribute concert, and you've purchased the $50 ticket in advance. As you enter the venue, you discover you've lost the ticket. Would you buy a $50 ticket? So as you enter the venue, you've lost the ticket. Would you buy the $50 ticket so that you can then go on to the concert? Andrew, let's see what they say. Yeah, just launched the poll. To our attendees, please respond to the poll. Just, uh, it is live as of now. Andrew, do you like Abba? I I love I love Dancing Queen. That's a that's always a hit. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I do I do like Abba. <laughs> We'll see how much our audience likes ABBA. <laughs> All right. Well, looks like about 82% have responded. And I'll go ahead and close the poll here in about five seconds. All right. It looks like 69% have responded with yes, and 31% have responded with no. Okay. Let's do this again. Let's clear your minds because, again, you're not randomly assigned to different questions. I'm going to give you a slightly different scenario. You've decided to see an ABBA concert, ABBA tribute concert, and the admission is $50 per ticket. As you enter the venue, you discover that you've lost a $50 bill. Not the ticket, but a $50 bill. You hadn't pre-purchased the ticket, but as you enter the venue, you've lost the $50 bill. Would you go ahead and buy the $50 ticket, assuming, of course, that you had the money with you? All right, Andrew, let's see what they say. Let's launch the poll. Oh, looks like I'll close the poll here in about five seconds to our attendees. Please uh, respond. All right, and closing the poll now. Looks like 78 have respond, 78 percent have responded with yes, and 22 percent have responded with no. Great. So when when this original study was done, uh, and and people were asked if they lost the ticket, would they buy another ticket? 46 percent said they would indeed go ahead and buy another ticket. That compares to 69 percent uh, from all of you. But if they lost a $50 bill in the original study, 88% uh, 
said they would go ahead and buy the ticket even though they'd lost the $50 bill. That compares to 78% for all of you. So again, it's not the levels that matter as much, but it's the fact that these two differ. In both cases, you're out $50 when it's time to enter the venue. And in both cases, you have to put, uh, give another $50 in order to see your ABBA, ABBA tribute concert. And so economically, these two scenarios are exactly the same. So we would predict, an economist would predict that a rational person would make the same decision in both places. So if you were willing to do it, you were willing to, to purchase the ticket when you had lost the first ticket, and equally willing to purchase the ticket when you'd lost a $50 bill, then you'd be exhibiting homo economicus behavior. But the fact that we, we see differences in the decisions means you're departing from that very rational decision making. So here, somehow we're engaging in mental accounting. Uh, when we lost the ticket, we sort of think of it as, oh geez, now I have to buy another ticket and then I'm paying $100 to see the ABBA tribute concert. And after all, who wants to pay $100 to see an ABBA tribute concert? Uh, but in the second scenario, somehow that was a different bucket and you lost a $50 bill and yes, that's very unfortunate, but it didn't really have anything to do to the, with the concert per se. And so you were then more willing to, uh, to buy the ticket to see the concert in that scenario. So again, what we're seeing is behavior that departs from homo economicus, that very rational type of behavior. And I have a, with my students in class, I call anytime we deviate from the rational homo economicus behavior, I call that abnormal behavior. Uh, and, and so when, when the students start talking about something, something they would do, and it's a departure from rational behavior, I say, oh, you're being abnormal. And of course, this is a, this is a nod to the cult film classic, which uh, Young Frankenstein, so I don't know how many of you remember that movie, that film, but in Young Frankenstein, Igor was sent to get a brain to put into this, this creature, and, and the original brain that Igor was meant to get, uh, I, I, I believe he dropped it on the floor, so he had to get a substitute brain, and when asked, well, whose brain did you get? He said, Abby somebody, Abby normal, and, and so that's why I call this type of behavior that departs from homo economicus, I call that abnormal behavior. So that's what we'll call, uh, call it today. Uh, so it turns out we have plenty of evidence across a variety of disciplines that abnormal behavior does come into play. Uh, so classic economics, classic finance and accounting research tends to assume homo economicus, but uh, more recently we're starting to see the, the psychology seep into these different disciplines. Uh, and we're seeing uh, a new field called behavioral economics and behavioral finance and certainly behavioral accounting. And that's where we're trying to, to marry the two disciplines of the classic economics and the psychology because people exhibit both kinds of behaviors. So what makes us abnormal? We have limitations in our ability to solve problems. So a quote from a few minutes ago, homo economicus, unswervingly rational, completely selfish, and can effortlessly solve even the most difficult optimization problem. Well, it turns out we're not all like that, at least not all the time. Uh, there's a, a, a new book out by Richard Thaler uh, called Nudge, and some of you might be familiar with this book as well. And, and they say, unlike members of Homo economicus, members of uh, Homo sapiens, that's you and me, make predictable mistakes. So that's where this predictable irrationality idea comes from. Because we use heuristics and fall prey to fallacies and because the way we're, we're influenced by our social interactions. So Richard Thaler is pretty famous for introducing some of these ideas into economics, into economics discipline. In fact, he won the 2017 Nobel Prize for Economics for his contributions to behavioral economics. And this, uh, this headline I particularly like, Richard Thaler wins the Nobel in, e Nobel in economics for killing homo economicus and I would say maybe discovering Abby Normal. Uh, so this is very much sort of being brought into our, our you know, business disciplines and, and the economics and really recognizing that people behave in a way that's not always completely rational. Uh, Daniel Kahneman has a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, in which he talks about two systems of thinking. Uh, one is called the reflective system of thinking. That's very, very deliberate, uh, very conscious, very methodical, calculative, it's, it's analyzing and making judgments. It's a, what I suppose you would do if you were thinking about buying a house, making an offer on a house, or perhaps 
uh, buying a new car. The other system is called the automatic system. It's very rapid, very instinctive, and it really takes care of most of our behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. It's very fast, so reflective is unfortunately very slow way of thinking and processing information, whereas the automatic is very rapid and very in instinctive and, you know, uh, and, and handles most things. Now, it turns out that things can go awry in both of these systems, and this is what can lead us to some of our abnormal behavior. Uh, sometimes our reflective system is not even aware of a problem that we're encountering, and, and so it doesn't even kick in. Sometimes our automatic system, uh, because it's, it's quick and intuitive, leads us to the wrong conclusions. And, and sometimes even when we do engage the reflective system, sometimes even that can lead us to a wrong decision because of some of our, our tendencies that we engage in, some of this sort of irrational decision making. This is a wheel of, I guess, abnormal behavior. You can think of it like that. And I realize you can't read uh, you know, the text on this, but the point of this is that we exhibit a lot of irrational decision-making behavior. And this has been documented across many years of research uh, and in many different settings. And there's just a number of different things that we do that cause us to deviate from what I would say homo economicus behavior and to, to portray abnormal behavior. Uh, you know, sometimes we just have too much information and we can't process it all. And one thing we see people doing is engaging in what we call anchoring. So uh, here, a famous example of the anchoring phenomenon is Tversky and Kahneman, again, they set up an experiment where they had uh, the participants spin a roulette wheel. Now, they kind of tricked the participants because they were predetermined to stop at either the number 10 or the number 65. And then they asked the participants, what percentage of the United Nations that was are, are African nations? And what's interesting is those whose wheels stopped at 10 guessed that on average 25% of the United Nations was from African nations. Those whose wheels stopped at 65 guessed that 45% of the United Nations represented African nations. Now, clearly, the roulette wheel had nothing at all to do with the makeup of the United Nations. And so what they were documenting is a tendency just to anchor on numbers and it can influence our, our judgments and decision making without us even realizing it. So it's interesting to think about how this might affect business decisions. You can imagine how this might play out in the workplace in making, for example, investment decisions, uh, ass assessing different investment decisions, or in a performance evaluation. Another, another uh, tendency we see is what we call a halo effect. And so we tend to take one characteristic of, say, an individual and sort of um, e expand it and, and let it spill over and affect our judgments about other characteristics. So, for example, if I think you're, you're attractive, I also think you're smart. So, again, this can have important implications for performance evaluation. Uh, and we've already seen the idea of this mental accounting. I've, I've shown you an example of that. Uh, there's also uh, what we call the Lake Wolvagon effect. Some of you may remember Garrison Keillor's uh, Prairie Home Companion. Uh, and Lake Wolvagon was his mystical town where all the women were strong, all the men were good looking, and all the children were above average. So all, this idea all the children are above average, that actually is a thing. People tend to, to sort of make that fallacy, make that mistake. And then last one uh, is another one is, is loss aversion. And we're actually going to talk about that one uh, in a few minutes. So the point is that people are irrational, but they're irrational in sort of a predictable way. So we, we kind of know how people are going to respond, at least in certain, cer certain circumstances and in certain ways. So this, this takes us back to this idea of what about monetary incentives? You know, when do, do monetary incentives work in the workplace? Are they effective? Or do, or do they not? And one of the things that's important to remember is that unlike homo economicus, we people, real people, value things other than money. We value reciprocity and fairness. Uh, we value social norms. We want to conform to social norms. Trust is important to us and trust in others and being seen as trustworthy. These are things that matter to us that likely wouldn't matter to homo economicus. So let's think about trust for a minute. Let, let's, let's see, uh, you know, how, how you would feel and how ho homo economicus would respond to something that's called the trust game. So this is a very famous game in the economics literature. 
imagine you're player one. Now, here's how this game is going to work. I'm going to give you $100. You're player one. I'm going to endow you with $100. And I'm going to tell you, you can give any amount you choose to player number two. So you're player number one. You've been given $100. You can give any amount you'd like to player number two. Uh, you can give zero. You can give all 100. Now, the interesting part of this game is that in giving that to player number two, the experimenter is actually going to take whatever you've decided to give to player number two and is going to triple it. So whatever you give will go to player number two in triplet. If you decide to give one dollar, player number two will get three. If you decide to give all 100, player number two will get 300. And then in the game, player number two gets to decide how much to give back to you. Now, again, player number two can give any amount he or she wants. Zero or player number two can keep the full amount that he or she has been given. So the question is, if you were player number one, how much would you give to player number two? Keeping in mind that player number two doesn't have to return anything, but whatever you do give player number two gets tripled, right? So think about what would you do if you were player number one? How much would you send to player number two? Now, homo economicus would look at this situation and say, well, player number two has, has no incentive to give me anything because if player number, player number two can keep it all for himself. So knowing that, I'm going to assume player number two is going to be very homo economicus and keep it all for themselves. And I'm therefore going to keep all of the 100 for myself because if I give anything to player two, he or she will just keep it. So it's a very homo economicus way to think about this problem. And you would expect that you would just decide not to give anything. When we play this game, uh, and this has been played repeatedly over and over and over in many different studies in many different settings, what we see is that player number one tend to give about 50% of their endowment to player number two. And player number two tends to give money back to player one. So this is completely not homo, this is completely abnormal behavior because it goes everything against what e economists would predict would happen. And wh why does this happen? Well, because people tend to trust other people. And then player number two may feel a sense of responsibility and may want to reciprocate that trust. So these social interactions can lead us to exhibit what an economist would consider abnormal behavior. So, you know, given that, this begs a question, given that we're abnormal, how effective are monetary incentives in the workplace? So if you think about it, what we want are employees to exert effort. And in doing so, they're going to improve their performance. And then we're going to reward them. And then they in turn will exhibit more effort. So this is the idea of monetary incentives. But people don't value just money. People value things other than money. So this is going to uh, play into the decision and to the effectiveness of monetary incentives. Now, it turns out, <laughs> contrary to what Alfie Cohn has uh, presented, there are many examples of effective pay for performance systems or monetary rewards. Uh, let me give you a little bit of history of some of these. Nordstrom, everybody's familiar with Nordstrom. In the 1980s, uh, Nordstrom was the first organization, first retail organization to begin paying commissions. Uh, and it was met with huge success. They had the highest sales productivity in the industry. They had two times the industry average of sales per square foot. They had the highest perceived customer service. Um, they had the highest paid employees. There were shoe salesmen making upwards of $80,000 a year. This was back in the 19. 80s. They had 23% sales growth, 22% earnings growth. So certainly monetary incentives had a huge impact on that organization. Safelight Autoglass, this is another very famous case. In the 1990s, Safelight Autoglass, some of you may know this organization, they, they come to your home and they install uh, windshields into your vehicles. In the 1990s, Safelight Autoglass installed a piece rate system. So prior to that, the installers were paid an hourly rate. Uh, they decided to begin paying the installers based on the number of windshields that they had replaced, so based on their productivity. What they saw was a 44% gain in average worker output, uh, and the workers themselves experienced a 10% increase in their overall pay. Uh, and interestingly, they also saw Im improvements both from the effort effect, so the employees they had increased their effort and were more productive, but also from a selection effect. So this is another advantage 
of a monetary rewards. The employees who didn't like the new system, who, who felt the pressure and, and didn't want to be paid on productivity, they tended to leave the organization. Uh, and, and people that were attracted to this system, who were motivated by this uh, pay for performance, were attracted to the organization. And so they saw a shift in their workforce, which further improved uh, the productivity and output and performance of the organization as, as a whole. So those are two examples of monetary rewards really working and providing productivity and uh, financial performance improvements for those organizations. Sometimes, in fact, um, monetary rewards can work too well. We're all familiar with Wells Fargo, a very recent example. And at Wells Fargo, they had a, a very intense incentive system trying to motivate, uh, motivate their employees to to uh, get additional accounts, as many accounts set up for various customers as they possibly could. In fact, their motto was eight is great. They wanted every new customer coming into the bank, they wanted there to be eight new accounts for that customer, not just one or two. So they had very powerful monetary rewards uh, around these, these targets. And unfortunately, it worked so well that we saw the employees abusing the system. Uh, and in fact, there were over you know, 2 million unauthorized accounts were opened by the employees. And this is still, of course, being litigated today. So do monetary rewards work? I would say absolutely we see examples where they could be a very powerful motivator and sometimes too powerful of a motivator, which is a word of caution. Uh, you have to be careful about the unintended uh, consequences. So those are, those are a bit anecdotal. Uh, there's quite a bit of academic research examining whether or not monetary rewards work. In the academic research, there's a number of industry studies where they look at industries or organizations to really document whether or not there's performance improvements. And, and what we see is, you know, we tend to see uh, performance improvements when companies start providing monetary rewards. This graph on the right is from a 1996 study where they simply instituted uh, a bonus plan for their sales force. Uh, before the red line is prior to the bonus plan being implemented, after the red line are the incremental sales after the, the incentives were put into place. And, and so very clearly it improved the, the financial performance and the sales performance of, their, of that particular company's workforce. A later study with that same company, they removed the sales incentive plan and uh, this is not shown here, but the, the sales performance actually went back down. So we see many examples in the academic research about sales perform, sell, um, sorry, rewards, monetary rewards having a positive impact on performance. We also see documented in the academic literature, though, are sort of the, the Wells Fargo effects of the unintended consequences. Uh, performance uh, rewards are typically tied to performance targets, and so we see problems in companies related to slack building behavior. Every time, as soon as you start tying rewards to a specific target, you see people trying to manipulate that target. So we see this padding the budget or slack building behavior in the setting of the target itself. And we see what we call meet but not beat behavior. Once I, I meet that performance target, you know, then I go golfing for the rest of the quarter or, or you know, the rest of the time uh, and then start up again the, the next uh, performance evaluation period. Laboratory studies, there's many laboratory studies looking at the effectiveness of monetary rewards and the circumstances under which they work well and they don't work well, and, and, and can we you know, identify other influences on people's behavior. Uh, we do, again, see pay for performance, monetary rewards leads to greater effort, certainly than salary alone. Uh, we also have seen work looking at performance targets. Performance targets and when tied to rewards can be very motivating, but not if the targets get too hard to achieve. Uh, we also see things like fairness or organizational justice influencing people's reaction to those monetary rewards. Social norms can influence people's reaction to monetary awards. Uh, and another thing that comes out of this academic research is the reaction to monetary awards can depend on the nature of the task itself. So taking it all together, uh, I, would, I would say that science is not conclusive in this, but that the research shows that it depends whether or not monetary rewards works depends. Uh, so let's talk about some of the things that it depends upon. 
One of the things that is important uh, in introducing monetary rewards is making sure you have performance measures that are high enough quality to be able to base those rewards upon. Uh, so if you think about rewarding people based, with, on, based on monetary rewards, what we have is we expect them or we want them, we want to motivate effort. And when they, they exert effort, in theory, we, their performance is going to improve. Uh, and we got to measure that performance. In order to be able to reward that performance, we have to measure that performance. And once we measure that performance, then we can tie it to the monetary rewards that we're talking about. But the performance measures that we use turns out are pretty important, uh, pretty important piece because it's 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 the item that links the effort to the reward. Right? So one thing we'd like to see is we'd like to see performance measures that are sensitive to the employee's effort or something that's in that's in the employee's control. Because if the employee exerts effort and then has no impact on performance, then that's not going to be very motivating to tie some sort of monetary reward to that performance measure. If I can't control it, then you know, I'm not going to be very motivated to work towards that um, performance measure. Uh, so what we'd like to see is performance measure that is very sensitive to that effort. This is why we don't usually see lower level employees being rewarded on things like stock returns because a lower level employee has very little effect on stock returns. We see very high level executives being rewarded based on stock returns, but not so much lower level because it's just not as very sensitive to their day to day efforts and decisions. We'd also like to see performance measures that are precise, not noisy, not a lot of other things that are impacting that performance measure. Again, stock prices are very noisy. Um, and, and so we'd like to have performance measures that, that don't have all these other factors that might influence those performance measures that, again, are out of the employee's control. Lastly, we'd like to see performance measures that are congruent. And what I mean by that is they're congruent with the organization's objectives. So if the employee improves this, because remember, ultimately what we want when we say are monetary rewards effective, what we mean by that, are they effective in motivating employees to work harder, to make better decisions, and ultimately provide benefits and value to the organization? And so we need a performance measure that's congruent with the organizational goals. Go, uh, think back again to the Wells Fargo example. They had a performance measure, the number of accounts that were open, uh, that was then manipulated by the employees. So you could argue that, well, that was a performance measure that isn't necessarily congruent with the organization's goals. The organization's goals being presumably to satisfy customers and to eventually you know, achieve financial performance. So monetary rewards are more likely to work depending on the quality of the performance measures. And we'd like to see performance measures that are sensitive to the employee's actions, uh, precise and, and congruent with the organizational goals. Another thing that will affect the whether or not monetary rewards will, will work are the characteristics of the task. Now, it turns out this is where Alfie Cohn is, is kind of on the right path. Um, Alfie Cohn states that research suggests, by and large, rewards succeed at securing one thing only, temporary compliance. They don't motivate, they punish, um, ignore a reason, they discourage risk taking, and ultimately his underwriting uh, philosophy or, or position is that monetary rewards undermine interest, undermine intrinsic motivation. So it turns out he's he's right about this. There is a lot of academic research that shows that monetary rewards can, in some circum circumstances, what we call crowd out intrinsic motivation and might actually do more harm than good. So what I have here is, is a graph. On the x-axis, we have, it says, extrinsic rewards. That's just the monetary rewards. On the y-axis is performance, right? Uh, the, gray, the gray line is the total effect of the monetary rewards. And then the, the orange line is a price effect. And for now, it's, it's the same. So you'll see how these differ in a minute. If it's a boring task, then there is no intrinsic motivation. And so what we see is as we increase the intensity of monetary rewards, we're going to effectively motivate increased effort and increased performance. So this is without intrinsic motivation. A, say a boring task, maybe, uh, may, you know, maybe the safe light windshield installation after a while becomes a boring task. What if it's an interesting task, though? 
What if it's a creative task um, or maybe a scientist or a physician? At zero level of monetary rewards, at no extrinsic rewards, people in this situation are often intrinsically motivated to be high performers. They just are, they, it's something that they love, it's something they're interested in, so they are going to put forth uh, you know, high levels of effort and provide high performance even with, with no monetary rewards whatsoever. And so theory would suggest, and this is Alfie Cohn's position, that as you start to provide monetary rewards, somehow you start undermining that intrinsic motivation. For some reason, if you start paying me for it, then I start enjoying it less. And the more you pay me, sort of the, the less I enjoy it. And so as the monetary rewards go up, the intrinsic motivation represented by the blue vertical blue lines gets lower and lower and lower. The total effect, the gray line, which is the sum of the price effect, paying people for the effort, and the intrinsic motivation effect, that's just what comes from them intrinsically, the gray line, as you start providing more monetary incentives, begins to go down. So here's a situation where you're worse off with the monetary rewards because the intrinsic motivation is being crowded out. So we call that, we refer to that as a crowding out of the intrinsic motivation. The monetary rewards are, are taking away or undermining your intrinsic motivation to do this thing. Uh, now, depending on what these curves look like, you know, because this is just one depiction of the curves, the curves could look different, but depending on what these curves look like and where you are on the x-axis, it very well may be the case that you would be better off with no monetary rewards than with the monetary rewards. And again, this is in intrinsically motivating task settings where the task is somehow interesting uh, to the people involved. There's many experiments that document this crowding out phenomenon. Uh, this is one that I thought was interesting. This was in the 1970s. They took 24 undergraduate psychology students and they, they put them to work working on what they call a SOMA puzzle, which is these plastic pieces that you have to fit together into different configurations. So they give them a picture of a particular configuration and they would fit them, they, the, the students had to fit them together. Uh, but they also had on the table several magazines that you know were just sitting there. And these, by the way, were the exact magazines that were there. Remember, this was the 1970s. Uh, but the experimenter would leave the room and it turns out the students could work on the puzzles that they want or they could flip through the magazines. There were three different sessions. In the first sessions, they offered no pay for the different puzzles. And as you can see, you know, the control group and the treatment group uh, spent about the same amount of time working the puzzles. In session number two, they began paying the treatment group. And as you might expect, the amount of time they spent working on the puzzles, not flipping through the magazines, went up. In the third session, they removed the pay for the treatment group. And not surprisingly, the amount of time they spent working on the puzzles went back down. But what's interesting is it went back down even below the level of the people who had never been paid at all. And so the conclusion was paying the participants to do these puzzles undermined the fun of the puzzle, undermined the intrinsic motivation. So how should we pay, uh, how should we pay employees? Uh, when it's an interesting task. Maybe we can pay not for the quantity of activities, but for the quality of those activities. Here's a, a really interesting study by, uh, no kidding, some accounting researchers, some accounting researchers out of the University of Texas. They created a, an intrinsically motivating creative task. They had uh, their participants do rebus puzzles. And a rebus puzzle, you may know, you're, you're given a word or a phrase and you're asked to depict it with a diagram. And in the rebus puzzles, for example, here on the top left, you see a dollar sign and equal, uh, and then you know a square root. So this was meant to depict the money is the root of all evil. So they had their, their participants do these various rebus puzzles. We see square root of pie, lead foot, growing taller, chewing gum, now that one's a little bit lame, and Popeye. And then they had other participants score the creativity of these different rebus puzzles. And as you can see, chewing gum got a very low creativity score. Um, money is the root of all evil. That one got a very high uh, creativity score. And they looked at different ways to pay, different ways to provide monetary rewards. Some participants were given a flat rate. Some were paid just on the number of puzzles that they created. Some were, based, were paid based on the average creativity, and some were, were paid based on both creativity and quantity. And here are the results. Now on the left graph, left-hand side, 
This is showing the quantity of puzzles that were completed. And on the right hand side, the average creativity rating. Q stands, that indicates those are the people that were paid for quantity only. C, those are the people that were paid for creativity only. And then Q plus C, those are the people that were paid for both creativity and quantity. And what they found is people that were paid for quantity, all you got was quantity. You got high quantity, low quality. People that we paid only for creativity, that's what you got. You get what you pay for. You got high creativity, but very low quantity. What happens when we pay them for both? Turns out, relative to the quantity only condition, we got a large drop in creativity and only a, sorry, a large drop in quantity and only a small increase in creativity. So the conclusion was, if you care at all about creativity, just reward creativity. If, sorry, if all you care about is a creativity, just reward creativity. But if you value quantity at all, reward on quantity only, because at, paying on both, adding the creativity dimension does more harm than good. Now, why might this be? Well, again, it might be because of loss of intrinsic motivation. It might also be because it's hard to measure creativity. Remember, we talked about performance measure qualities are important to being able to effectively reward and motivate people. And so the conclusion, the thinking goes that monetary rewards are harmful in creative settings because they crowd out naturally high intrinsic motivation and possibly because performance is harder to measure in those types of settings. Uh, monetary rewards are also more likely to work depending on the type of the reward. Now, one way we can think about rewarding people is either with giving them a reward or actually giving them a punishment. So a carrot or a stick. Let's look at an example. There are two salesmen, Mr. Carrot and Mr. Stick, and they have to provide a demand forecast for the following month. This is sort of like a performance target. At the end of the month, they both receive a bonus. So Mr. Carrot, he forecast, forecasted 1,500, 1500 in sales. His actual sales were 100. His forecast error was 500. So his actual sales were 500 below what he had forecasted. He gets a bonus for quantity sold of $100 and no, no penalty bonus. Mr. Stick, on the other hand, he forecasted sales of $1,500. He had actual sales of $100, forecast error of $500. He had a bonus for quantity, quantity sold of $150, but he has a penalty for $50 because he didn't meet the target. And he ends up also with a total bonus of $100. So in both cases, they forecasted exactly the same. They had the exact, exact amount of sales. Uh, one of them is rewarded. Mr. Carrot is rewarded only for a bonus for the 100, 1,500 in sales. Mr. Stick gets a $150 bonus for the 1,500 sales, but a $50 penalty because of his forecast error. They both end up with $100. Now, economically, these are exactly the same situation. I ask you a question. Which contract would you prefer? Let's ask Andrew. Let's let's see what contract our participants would prefer. All right. The the poll is live now. So would you prefer the Mr. Carrot contract where you're getting a bonus for your actual sales in amount of 100? Or would you prefer the Mr. Stick contract where you're getting bonus, but also you're being penalized for your forecast error? At the end of the day, you also get a total bonus of 100. Which would you prefer? All right, we'll wait another 15 seconds to our attendees. Please respond. Which contract would you prefer? All right, looks like we'll close it now. And it looks like 80% have responded with Mr. Carrots and 20% have responded with Mr. Sticks. So I'm not surprised by that <laughs> because uh, this was actually a, another academic study, uh, again, by an accountant, uh, incidentally. And what she found was that even though these are economically exactly the same, 83 percent, very close to the 80 percent of our participants, prefer the Mr. Carrot contract. They prefer the bonus. They prefer the carrot contract over an economically equivalent penalty contract. So that's that's pretty interesting. We we have again we're, we're, that's sort of abnormal behavior. Um, now it turns out the reason this is is a well-documented tendency for us 
to really avoid losses. This is called loss aversion. So as you can see in this graphic, as you, as you gain, as you get rewards or bonuses, your happiness, the value, you know, your level of happiness goes up. You're happy with that. As you have losses, your happiness goes down. You are unhappy with that. But what we've seen over and over again in many different contexts is that for the same increment of a gain, the increase in happiness is much smaller than the decrease in happiness that you get for an equivalent size loss. So you respond much more negatively, negatively to a, a loss that is of equal magnitude but opposite direction of a gain. And, and this is called loss aversion. And it, it basically just says that losses loom larger than gains and that people really avoid uh, in, incurring losses. So it's interesting if you think about these two contracts, you all prefer the Mr. Carrot contract, but the question for us that's more important to us is which one are you going to work harder for? Under which contract will you work harder? Well, loss aversion suggests that you would actually work harder under the Mr. Stick contract because you want to avoid the loss and you're going to respond more negatively to that. So you actually will work even harder to avoid the loss. Uh, and so that's an interesting to think about, interesting thing to think about. Uh, and it occurred to some of my colleagues and, and, and I that, you know, why do we not see more stick type of uh, incentive plans uh, than we do carrot type of incentive plans. Carrot type incentive plans, bonus plans are much more prevalent, of course, in the workplace. And what we found, uh, we conducted a, an experiment and a, a study, and what we did was we introduced discretion into this particular bonus plan. And we said, okay, you have the Mr. Carrot, and you have the Mr. Stick, but overlaid on top of that, we're also going to provide for a discretionary bonus. So at the end of the day, your supervisor can, with his or her discretion, give you additional amounts of a bonus or not. So this is interesting. You can think about um, subjective performance evaluation as being one way to introduce this level of discretion. What's interesting about this is that supervisors who have now been given this discretion over your pay or over your performance evaluation, guess what? They are abnormal and they fall prey to some of those biases uh, leniency bias, something that we call the centrality bias, halo effects, favoritism. And so you're starting to get a little uncomfortable with this idea of that supervisor providing this discretionary part of your incentive system and the rewards. And what that amounts to is potentially, at least in your mind, potentially a breakdown between performance and the reward. I can perform, but because of this discretion from my supervisor, will I get that reward? So I might question that last link. And, and so trust becomes important in this kind of a setting. I have to trust my supervisor to provide that reward if in fact I do provide the performance. So we set up a setting in which this discretionary part of uh, the incentive system was at play uh, to see if that made any difference over, you know, in, which would provide more motivation to employees, either the carrot or the stick. Remember, we would expect the stick to be more motivating because people are trying to avoid losses. But what we found was once we provided for this discretion that the carrot became much more effective. Why is that? That's because the discretion made trust very important and the stick type of reward tends out, turns out it undermines trust. When a, when a stick type of incentive plan has been imposed upon you, you t it tends to undermine your trust in those superiors and because of that, it reduces the amount that you are motivated to work hard. And so we saw that in these settings that have any kind of discretion, it turns out the carrot uh, became more effective. And so this sort of makes sense because a lot of the workplace settings that we see, certainly for middle level managers and above, have some degree of discretion in the performance evaluation and in the reward system. And so that helps to explain why we see a much higher incidence of carrots in the real world than we do the sticks. So where does this leave us? Uh, and the question I, I leave you with is you know, whether or not you or your employees are homo economics, homo economicus or Abby normal. And I, I would say that the answer is yes, you're both. Sometimes you, you behave in a very homo economicus uh, way and other times you are very Abby normal. And so you have to remember that when designing your incentive systems. The question, do monetary rewards work? Of course, the answer, it depends. That's always the answer. 
but when designing reward system, the things that I want you to think about to always remember to consider is that it's really critical to have good performance measures. Uh, performance measures that are sensitive to the employee's efforts, uh, have a good degree of precision, as much precision as you can get, and they're also congruent with the organization objectives. It, it also depends on the characteristics of the task. Uh, so if you're in a setting, a high creativity setting where things are intrinsically motivating, you want to be very careful about providing the monetary rewards and, and the potential for crowding out or undermining the intrinsic motivation. And then lastly, the type of reward is important. Uh, in a creative setting, are you going to pay for quantity or are you going to pay for creativity? What is it you're trying to get out of those employees? Uh, objective versus subjective or discretionary. Uh, the discretionary bonuses make or discretionary rewards uh, make trust really important. So what are the ways in which you can foster that trust? Uh, and, and in particular with rewards and penalties, if you're going to use you know, penalty types of incentives, then you've got to be thinking about other ways to foster that trust. So at the end of the day, um, contrary to what Alfie Cohn suggests, Science is far from inclusive on the effectiveness of monetary rewards. It really does depend on the situation and the setting. And in reality, it's much more nuanced than that, than, than, than Alfie Cohn suggests, and of course, challenging, which uh, makes all of our jobs, I guess, a little more difficult, but also a little more interesting. Andrew? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Said it's all. I, 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 uh, it's been an incredibly insightful and, and, and thought-provoking presentation. And it uh, looks like we have time for just a few questions here. Um, and so we have a, a, a question from Michael who says, he, he says, I understand that there are all types of monetary rewards in their own way, but what research has been conducted to measure the success of monetary rewards versus other types of rewards, like travel, time off, et cetera? What are some of these results and, and, and what is your personal opinion? Yeah, actually there is uh, more and more research on non-monetary rewards. Uh, in fact, uh, I am um, currently doing some research with an organization that provides electronic platforms for providing um, these rewards where employees can gather points for doing different activities. They might be fitness related activities or the research that we're going to be conducting with this organization is going to be performance based activities. Uh, and I think we, the research, uh, there's a lot more to be done in this area, but we are seeing that these non-monetary rewards can have an important impact. Uh, I worked one time many years ago with a company called Cargill and they were giving monetary rewards for uh, employees who were able to generate different patents. And at one point they, they did away with the monetary rewards and instead started giving, um, you know, just recognition plaques. And it turns out that that had more of a motivating effect in that particular setting than the monetary reward. So that's an example of where the monetary rewards uh, very well might have been sort of undermining the intrinsic motivation. So there definitely is a, a place, and a time and a place for the non-monetary rewards. And it very well may be those, those situations where there is a lot of intrinsic motivation. And maybe that's a way to tap into that intrinsic motivation. But there's a lot to be learned here. Um, there's another stream of academic research that shows even very small rewards can have a pretty powerful impact. Um, Mary Kay is known for this kind of approach. Mary Kay, as you know, has uh, typically, you know, housewives, women who are selling their product in, in their workforce, and they are not particularly highly paid, but what they do with these employees is they provide many, many incentives in the form of recognition. Uh, so those can be very powerful incentives. Uh, and, and again, that might be a setting where those, those particular employees are very much intrinsically motivated toward those tasks. So I think there's definitely a role for non-monetary rewards. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much. And, and kind of like on, on along the same lines, uh, we have a question from Jessica, um, kind of talking about these monetary, um, you know, bonuses. But but um, Jessica asks, how effective is intermittent reinforcement, uh, i.e., surprise monetary bonuses versus planned expected bonuses? Uh, the research that I am aware of, I think, has shown, as I recall, has shown that the well, it depends on what you mean by in intermittent. If it's a surprise and it's sort of after the fact, I think there's been some research to show that that's not very effective and that that's, that actually has a detrimental effect because if I'm 
perform and I'm, I'm surprised with some sort of reward after the fact, then I tend to expect that the next time. And if I don't get it, then I become disillusioned and actually demotivated. Um, I'm not I'm trying to think. I don't recall research that specifically looks at sort of the periodicity. Am I better off doing it uh, you know, much more often or uh, more spread apart? I'd have to go look at that. Um, yeah, my intuition, I think, would be that what's more important is that it, it be at regular intervals as opposed to being uh, more sort of sudden and out of surprise. But um, I would have to take a look at the research to, to see if there is research on that particular question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I guess we, we have time, I think, for, for one more question. Um, I think uh, we have a set. A question that says, according to your examples, do you think it's easier to reward performance, economically speaking, in operations than in corporate environments? Is it easier to reward performance uh, in operations as opposed to corporate environments? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think that what I would say is the key is being able to measure the performance effectively. So maybe uh, maybe the thinking is that in corporate environments it's hard to measure the performance and I think there's probably some truth to that. Uh, for example, one of the things you might want to reward among your employees is their leadership potential. That's incredibly hard to get at but could be incredibly important in a lot of settings. So if that's what our, our listener is thinking about corporate environments, mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think it comes down to the efficacy of the performance measurement. And in fact, that's why we see so much subjectivity and performance evaluation in corporate environments, because there's so many of the softer skills and, and dimensions of performance right. that really hard to measure in an objective way. Uh, so I, I would say it's maybe harder for that reason, for the performance measurement part. Uh, but I, I think it can be just as effective. And I think uh, we do see a lot of it. So I think it's probably pretty important and pretty powerful way to motivate people even in these you know corporate environments yeah exactly well thank you so much uh, i think i think we're going to uh, draw things to a close here and i just want to say thank you again for your you know thorough presentation obviously a lot of great takeaways here um and thank you all to for us to join us today and, and, and dr said it's all if you have uh, i'll turn this over to you with any final words no i just would like to thank everybody i appreciate uh your attention i appreciate the opportunity uh, <laughs> academics always love to talk about the research that we do we think it's pretty cool and so we love to share it with uh, with people out there that are actually in the trenches. And hopefully you found something uh -huh. useful today that uh, you know you can take back with you. So thank you very much for participating. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And uh, to our attendees, wherever you may be in the world, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.